Welcome back to Lamb's Cryptoverse. This is basically the second part of my introduction to everyone. Today we're going to be discussing how I analyze cryptocurrencies. When I conducted my own research, I found lots and lots of issues. Here I just bulleted a few. So when I analyzed the overall market from top down, I noticed that most YouTubers and people on Medium and other blogs, they focus on top down technical analysis. And that could be anything from uh, the on-chain metrics, uh, or looking at charts of the overall cryptocurrency market, or looking at um, supply and demand, things like that in terms of what's coming on exchanges, coming out. But it's just all top down. I mean, top down is good and that's how I think, but you don't want to get stuck in that. Another thing is, a uh, point is um, faulty interpretations. Everyone's always, always bullish. No matter what chart they show you, and it's always charts, they always interpret it in a bullish manner, and it shouldn't always be like that. Certain charts, certain data points are contrarian indicators, and, and, but their investors don't seem to be reading it that way. Lastly, I already mentioned this, there's overemphasis on charting, not just normal charting, but really fancy charting. Bollinger Bands, Tom D. Mark, who's been around forever, but all of a sudden he's getting really popular with his 13-point uh, trend indicator. And of course, Fibonacci. People love Fibonacci in this area. After doing a project deep dive, so now this we're moving from top down to bottom up, basically. These are the individual projects like Polkadot and Cardano. After looking at YouTubers, uh, their videos and Medium, Medium uh, blogs, I discovered that most shit coins, and I'm not talking just about the 20,000 or 19,999 coins that are shit coins. It's, it's even the top 10, top 15 coins, most of them are shit coins. It's, it's pretty sad. And of course, I'm excluding a stable coins, but even those have issues, right? Like um, algorithm, algorithmic stable coins and Tether, those have issues too. Uh, second point here, many YouTubers, YouTubers are shilling coins. So basically they're getting paid by the for-profit or foundations that back these projects. And that's what's really sad, is that you have corporations back in some of these coins. And what these corporations do is they issue coins, right? That it, they were worth, they were not, they didn't exist. So they issue these coins, they get hundreds of millions of dollars of value from these ICOs, and then they, they use those coins to pay, you know, after they sell the coins, they use th that money to pay for marketing of the of those coins to keep them elevated. So there's a lot of uh, shysters around there. And thirdly, there's an overemphasis on narratives and charts. I already mentioned charts. So maybe I should talk about narratives. They, uh, YouTube's focus a lot on, on certain, I'm trying to think of certain, certain, some of these stories, like, um, NFTs, uh, maybe a project that is very focused on NFTs and they just focus way too much on that use case. And the same thing with uh, another use case of uh, stable coins. Uh, an example is an unstable coin of Terra, Lu Terra Luna. Everyone focused on the algorithmic stable coin within that lunar, I'm sorry, Terra Luna ecosystem. But there was more to that ecosystem than that one stable coin. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh, the YouTube is not broad enough in, in the way they analyze these uh, projects. YouTube is not reading indicators properly. So even when they have good indicators, they're not reading them and understanding them properly. And a good example, and it's kind of technical, but it, it's good to talk about is options. I'm going to talk about this in the future with, with some charts on, on call options, activity, open interest, and put options, open interest. But for now, uh, the example I'll give you is a put to call ratio. 
That's a contrarian indicator. When the put to call ratio is high, meaning it's over one, that's bullish. And when it's below 0 0.7, 0 0.6, that's bearish. But that's not how it's being read by YouTubers. And secondly, misreading social media. Sometimes there's a lot of buzz about Bitcoin, for example, or uh, cryptocurrencies, because maybe a crypto project is crashing, like Terra Luna, and uh, then you've got Celsius, and, and these sort of problems with uh, ex exchange platforms like Voyager. And sometimes there's a lot of buzz related to that, and it needs to be interpreted properly. If there's a lot of buzz because something's crashing, it, it doesn't mean it's good. It, it's 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 good buzz. It could be bad buzz. So you can't just look at a, a chart of the activity on Twitter and Reddit. You need to see why there's a lot of social media activity behind the scenes. Why what people are talking about. So I'll talk about that later too in a, in a future video. And lastly, not recognizing self feedback loops. This could be a little complicated if you've never seen it before. Most people never heard of self-feedback loops until 2007, 2008. That's when everyone started talking about the mortgage crisis, right? And CDOs and how the mortgage companies, especially subprime mortgage companies, somehow affected banks and the whole financial system became at risk. We have the same type of self-feedback loops in the crypto world. It's a very incestuous and reflexive market. And I'll just give one example for save of time. And that's Terra Luna. The Terra Luna ecosystem included Anchor Protocol, right? For, for lending and borrowing. It included USDT, right? It included the stable coin and included Luna. Right, if you recall, the Terra Luna team, I'm sorry, project was about having a successful algorithmic stablecoin. But it turns out it became a death spiral. Why? Not just because it was algorithmic, which, which is a, an, another risk, but because it was connected to uh, Anchor Protocol. And lastly, in an effort to back up the stablecoin, the Luna Financial Guard supported, they had a backstop or the beginning of a backstop of the stablecoin uh, by buying Bitcoin. And they were also thinking of buying Avalanche. I th actually, they did buy some Avalanche. And you don't do that. You don't buy, you don't support, I should say, a stablecoin by buying a pro-cyclical, reflexive, I should say, asset to back it. What they should have backed the stablecoin with was uh, T-bills, right? Because T-bills and treasury notes are inversely correlated with the financial system and equities, and I was about crypto, but they didn't do that. So I think you always need to be aware of the existence of some type of self-feedback loop. And um, sorry for the confusion there, but this is something I think everyone should be aware of. I, I think a great book to read about, which is equally complex and difficult to understand, is called The Alchemy of Finance. It was published way back in the 80s by the famous George Soros. And he talks about, in his diary, which is in this book, he talked about how he, him and Steve, uh, I'm sorry, Stan Druckmiller broke the Bank of England, right? You remember that? That was way back in the 80s when he broke the British pound. And he talks about uh, self-feedback loops, but he calls it reflexivity. So I, I, I think everyone should read that book. Focus on a one metric when analyzing cryptocurrency projects. There's too much focusing on charts. I mentioned this already. When And this is on individual charts. Before I mentioned charts for like the overall market, this is individual charts of projects. So for example, Algorand. 
if uh, YouTuber sees the chart going higher and higher, the price keeps going higher, they get really bullish. And they think it's going to go parabolic. And you know what? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. The second thing is there's a lot of reliance on returns. And remember, if something's too good to be true, it's not true. Something's wrong. I, I always look at the Fed funds rate or TIVO rate. If something's paying you higher than 2-3%, you got to be suspicious. But there's an over-reliance in high staking returns and high DeFi returns. And we saw how that turned out on the Anchor Protocol, for example, that was given 20% returns and then that blew up. Thirdly, there's too much focus on an individual project's metrics. For example, high speed. Everyone's touting Solano's high speed. But just because something has very, very high TPS doesn't mean it's a great project. Maybe it could have security issues, and we saw that with Solana. Maybe it's too centralized. And we're seeing that somewhat with Solana too. It's, it's more centralized than it turns out to be superficially. Yes, Solana has a lot of validators, but it doesn't mean it's decentralized. So these projects need to really be uh, analyzed deep down. And lastly, there's what I call ghosting of venture capital heavyweights. Just because Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z, is in a project doesn't mean it's good. Like these big VC firms, they're in almost every project. Andreessen Horowitz is a great example. They're behind many, many projects because they, they like to diversify. So just because they're in a project doesn't mean it's a great project. It's not like putting a stamp of approval that you see with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. I, I, you know, as you know, I'm not a big, big fan of Warren Buffett, but generally when Warren Buffett buys something, you could feel like it's a pretty safe investment. And you don't see that here in the crypto world with the VC firms. Lastly, I want to show you how I'm going to look at projects in the overall cryptocurrency slash digital asset market. I think we need a holistic approach using what I call MFT, macro fundamental and technicals. And I mentioned this earlier, so I'll talk about it quickly. Macro basically means geopolitics, interest rates, inflation. Fundamentals of the project can, can mean any characteristic of that individual project, going from funding, and that, not just overall funding, but seed funding, funding after the ICO, it goes on and on. The same thing with the team, founding team versus new people, who's representing the company, who's a spokesperson for the company. Tokenomics, it's, it's not just whether there's a limited number of uh, tokens, like you see with Bitcoin, or unlimited. It also has to do with inflation. So tokenomics it, itself could be a Pandora's box. And lastly, I too will look at techno, technical analysis, but not as complicated and as in-depth as, as everyone else looking at Fibonacci and Tom DeMarc indicators and channels and all that. But I think technical analysis is important. So that's going to be my three-legged stool that I'm going to be looking at. I'd like to thank everyone once again for listening to me and um, remember I'm not paid or mandated for any reviews that I do in the future and this is not financial advice but it's for your education and entertainment purposes only please hit the subscribe button up there or is it down there I don't know and please hit the like button because if you don't hit the like button I'm not going to move up in those google algorithms and search terms thank you very much